Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, um, you can support these programs at even $1 a month at YouTube or head over to patreon.com slash Aksum. Today, our special guest is Diakon Shoit. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Deacon Henok, for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, um, I know with you and I, we can definitely get big brained and hit some of the big issues, but I usually like to start these things off. I don't know how familiar you are with the show with certain uh, biographical sketches. And for me, I have been very interested on the science side in some research into a, a so-called or alleged religiosity gene, which I do believe in, but I always think these things are some combination of nature and nurture. So I think the environments we grow up in are very important. I'd love to hear from you the faith of your parents and the faith of your grandparents and what way it had had an impact on you, because obviously you're a servant of the church. And my right. question is always like, how do we make more servants of the church? Right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you again for having me on your podcast. I think um, I don't, to be honest, I don't really know the um, religiosity or how devout my grandparents were mm -hmm. um did you know any of them i knew my paternal grandmother my dad's mother but aside i never knew his dad mm -hmm. and for my mother i don't recall meeting either of my grandparents on my maternal side um but um as far as my parents go um uh, they they weren't very religious when I was younger. I mean, obviously I was baptized into the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church when I was a child, when I was an infant. But um, aside from that, I, I didn't really, I'm sure my parents tried their best to, um, you know, take me to church when I was younger. But, you know, like as soon as you have a say so or you just don't want to go, you probably just don't go. So uh, that was kind of that for me growing up. Um, my sort of faith journey like I said, I was baptized in the church when I was uh, an infant, but uh, going to Ethiopia in uh, two, between the years of 2005 and 2007, mm -hmm. that was really what immersed me into the life of the church. And that's when I really, I guess they call it got bit by the bug or whatnot, but that's when <laughs> I really started um, really taking an interest, especially coming back to the US in around 2007, when there wasn't really that much uh, opportunity to go to church like there was back home you know back home yeah. you can go to church every day if you wanted to mm -hmm. but here it was only like a sunday morning uh opportunity so that really got me just really um really wanting to learn more about the church and spend as much time as i could in the church and that was also what uh spurred me to want to go and study theology i had this misconception but i think it was providential now that i look back on it that i assumed every deacon studied theology like or if they didn't study theology i thought every deacon at least i like, grew up in a monastery or if not a monastery their yeah. local church and they learned all these things and so for me i was like i'm a i'm here in the u.s like i don't know anything about theology or the church and stuff i was like i have to go and take that initiative and go and study theology and then years later, I find out it's like no one really studies theology like that. You know, as far as like yeah. it's not a requirement to be a priest or a deacon and to like to study theology like that, you know? Yeah, so, I'm, I'm in my early 30s now and I have uh, been a deacon for more than seven years now. And no one has required, uh, let alone encouraged really me to take any sort of courses. But this summer I'm taking actually at your alma mater, St. Vlad's, I'm, I'm taking a, a, an Old Testament course. And it's just for the summer. It's just four weeks, very brief, but it's nice. Mm -hmm. And there's actually another shout out to uh, Diakon Abed. He's an Eritrean deacon in Texas that I've met. He's he's in the course as well. I don't know if there's anyone else, but the, the kind of orchestrators say there are about 200 people learning in this Old Testament course. There's another course that's on patristics. So shout out to right. St. Vlad's. You know, they're, they're doing things with this post-Zoom world we're in. And I do want to get back to this point yeah. because I've said, many times on my show uh, with all due respect to our hierarchs because they inherited something that was a bit chaotic i think that our church has been kind of de facto in belief orthodox but in um in structure 
I think, and let's say de jour in, in, in structure in terms of always having this kind of connection to the metropolitans, but in, um, in organization, in like proper organization, not just having someone on top, but like the, like having a well-oiled machine, I think we have had a very, what I would call Protestant way of everybody just doing their own thing, extremely decentralized system where mm -hmm. there was a hierarch, but it seemed like nobody was really, um, you know, listening to him. And, and, you know, I mean, for centuries, it was an Egyptian guy. They say, and I've said it a few times on the show, you know, sometimes he was a Muslim, sometimes he was a Christian with concubines. There's a lot of uh, questionable things in, in the history, but I do want to, I'll take it back a little bit to explore a little bit more. Um, you said your parents had you baptized, right? Yeah, it, mm. that's a very common thing that even, um, you know, my parents who kind of leaned more agnostic, I would say, did that, you know, to kind mm. of fulfill their, their cultural obligations. But in addition to that, I wonder, for example, were you baptized back home or here in the U.S.? And when you're baptized, did they then start taking you to church every Sunday? Was there any prayer at home on a daily or weekly basis? Like for me, we prayed only during holidays. So like Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, um, but there was no daily prayer, uh, no weekly prayer or anything like that. Right. Yeah. Well, I was born here in, in, uh, in the U S in California. So I was, um, definitely baptized here, mm -hmm. um, after I was, um, uh born but um you know it's i don't i don't really recollect like daily or weekly prayers and whatnot um yeah i don't i don't really remember that i did have a very strong uh connection with my spiritual father but that was, that was here in seattle his name was abba hadis mm -hmm. um so he did uh, he did come to our house often um and things like that but i think you know it wasn't a very um like religious like upbringing i'm sure my, my parents okay. did try though i'm not i'm not trying to you know say my parents didn't try but no I no think, no shade just yeah. just keeping it real because again yeah. it's like a it's a deep question i've had because i've seen some parents who push strongly on their kids and their kids act by rebelling against that but i've seen right. uh you know looser like my parents were in the looser category but they you know they produced me um i've seen strict parents also produce good deacons as well and so you know mm -hmm. not just deacons but the faithful I'm, I'm just curious about this question of parenting and and uh what involvement they could have but going back to your moment you were saying in the mid to late aughts or the 2000s it's interesting, I've talked to several people who've had something like that, and I, I would call it like a sort of conversion moment, but we we didn't really have conversion moments because we were cradle orthodox. So right. um, you must have had some fluency in the languages of Ethiopia in order to have mm -hmm. this relationship with the uh, Abanefs or the, the father of the soul, the spiritual confessor, and even to, to gain anything fruitful at all from a trip back to Ethiopia. So at least your parents taught you how to speak then right they did when i was um when i was when i between the year uh, the grades of like fourth and sixth grade i believe i lived in eritrea so that's where i actually learned how to write the alphabet so and i bring that up because that really helped me when i was living in Magala, um uh, during that period because but to be honest, for the most part, I was trying to find um, resources in English. I'm sorry, did you uh, say Makala or in Eritrea? Yeah. No, uh, well, I lived in Eritrea from the, um, when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And that's where I learned uh, Fida. Fida, from a yeah. case or from who? Uh, from my guardian at the time. Amazing. The person I was living with. Yeah, yeah, Amazing. Yeah, and then, but when I was in Makala, that was when I really... Um, I like I was trying to recall and that's why learning things when you're a child is like so important because I, I never you I never utilized what I learned in Eritrea like the FIDA and stuff. Mm -hmm. But when I went back to um that might have been providential too, but when I was living in Ma'ala, that's when I actually started to uh try to remember what I had learned as a child, like the FIDA and stuff. Yeah. But to be honest, I didn't really read it like that i was still trying to practice so i was trying to find resources 
in English. And luckily, the dean of the theological college in Ma'ala, his name was Abbasillas. And uh, he spoke English. So that, that was That's like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So he was um he was like very instrumental in like teaching me a lot of things. Like I was like an open book, like whatever he said, or, or I should say like a sponge. Like I was just soaking in everything. Like mm -hmm. he was um he was teaching he was you to teaching. sing or to read or what? No, it was just really just about spirituality at that oh, point. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. Okay, okay. Yeah. I wasn't ordained until 2008, and that was between 2005 and 2007. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I was just like, I didn't know left from right in the church. So he was just really just explaining things to me uh, and things like that. So, yeah, initially it was English, but the more time I spent in the church, like, the better like my Amhari got, the better my reading became. And then to where I took my own initiative to like read things in the original languages, which I know is very difficult for people entering the church and not even entering the church, but even like people who are cradle like us, who like, um, who don't speak the languages, they might not have had the ability to learn Fidel or anything like that. And everything is just very difficult for them and whatnot as much as they want to be in the church there's just like so many hurdles and stuff like i know i'm sure you know a lot of ethiopians who might go to the coptic church or mm -hmm. other eastern orthodox churches and stuff but to really stay in the church i think is really um somewhat of a struggle uh agreed shout out to uh, yotc yeah. who just opened up the uh sawaswa uh named after that church in addis ababa St. Paul Church is an English speaking focused Ethiopian American led right. parish in DC. And of course, um, you know, some yeah. people have been arguing about what's the first. You know, the, the Caribbeans have been doing it for decades. Our Blessed Father Abu Nisak started right. the major churches in Los Angeles, DC, New York that were all originally English speaking focused. But yeah, there's something about us that our parents instilled some cultural knowledge that that allowed us kind of a foot in the door, but the rest of it had to to come from you. So, right. I mean, a lot of people go back home and, you know, let's be frank, let's be real. They, they go home to turn up, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, they're going out and partying and stuff, especially, you know, the drinking age is lower in Ethiopia than it is in the United States. So how did you, how did you keep that spiritual focus when you went back home? Did you have anything back in America that had influenced you? Like, had you begun thinking about that theology that you later, you know, went for? No, the the idea of theology really came for me. I was um there was a uh it was like um a community center. I think it was called MYC. It stood for like Ma'ala Youth Center, I believe. And there were there were people actually from Seattle like I'm based out of and so they would come from the University of Washington and volunteer there. And uh, I believe one of them was telling me how like Abu Nabalo studied theology. Yep. at these these schools and stuff and i was like oh wow. that was the first time i like i i, I guess found out about theology i was like princeton. oh wow you can he's yeah, a princeton yeah, exactly. alumnus he wrote his dissertation his famous uh dissertation we won't get into uh the nitty-gritty of but you know it's always yeah. got some spicy conclusions in there for some people whose feelings get hurt i see yeah, yeah. <laughs> no but you're right and when when i found out about that i was like okay that's something i can do and i remember me and um Zagabriel, Gabriel, we were talking about like theology at the time, and he was just saying like, we were both kind of like, well, you could do this as a profession, just read mm -hmm. theology. Like, we were just thinking like you could read theology all day long. We thought that was what being a professor of theology was, but that was really what I just didn't want to spend my life doing anything else but like reading and studying theology. That was like what oh, I wanted good. to do. So, yeah. So um, that was kind of how. That was kind of what got my mind going when I was like, okay, when I come back to the States, I'm, I'm going to be, that's what I'm going to do. So I went to a community college. And after that, I went to Hellenic College in Boston and like did a liberal arts degree with like a major in theology there. Um, and, and how was same. that? Because that's a Greek school, right? It um, is, yeah. How accepting and receptive were they to Ethiopians? And were you conscious of any... Um, theological differences obviously there are i would say more similarities than differences but certainly there are certain things presented differently and at the end of the day our churches have not been in communion since officially 451 ad right 
Yeah, I think um, the professors were were always welcoming. I never had any issues with the professors. Um, I, you know, there were some students um, who were kind of, um, yeah, who weren't really uh, liking, I guess, the fact maybe that I was Oriental Orthodox or anything like that. But that was very few students. Um, but as far as like the theology, I remember telling people I was going to go study theology there and they were always like, they thought I was going to be like indoctrinated or something like that with like Eastern Orthodox <laughs> theology or something. I don't know. Two natures. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. But um, I think to be honest, that's what been one of the struggles of studying theology for me is that because it's not like any other like discipline and it has to do with the faith and there are like lines you can't cross when it comes to the faith. Like it's always been like so, like I always had to be cautious with what with what I was reading, um, mm -hmm. and this probably goes into the whole uh, Augustine or Augustine of Hippo thing. But um, it was just something that you really had to be careful with what you were studying, and also you were studying a lot of things that didn't really relate to your own tra to the Ethiopian tradition. At least when I was at Saint Vlad's, I was more conscious of that. Mm -hmm. Like getting into things like liturgical theology or, you know, even church history, you have to take two semesters of church history. But it's like you they they make a, uh, an effort to, like, really be sensitive to to the words like miaphysite and stuff like that. And like, you know, when they're talking about what's going on in church history, they try to touch on like all like areas, you know. So if they're talking, if they're in like the the fourth century or something. They touch on like what's going on in India and Ethiopia and like in every kind of uh, geographical area, at, at least as it pertains to the students in the class. Um, yes, I think, I think, they, I they think just, they're yeah. surprisingly kinder to us than they would be, for example, the Roman Catholics who share like 600 more years of shared history with them. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that recently there was um, my friend, Dr. Michael Wingert, who's a friend of the program, Syriac scholar. He was on Ancient Faith Radio. And one of the commenters are like, are you trying to get us to like the Orientals? Uh, meaning us, right? Um, right. I, I know that uh, the press for St. Vladimir's press has been publishing this whole Coptic patristic series where they do things on like Pope Cyril VI and Pope Shenouda and Matthew the Poor. And it's, right. it's very fascinating to me that they're doing that. Um, I, part of me thinks there may be a financial incentive involved, but part of me wants to believe it's the love of God that is trying to have safe ecumenism, uh, ecumenism between the Orthodoxes, um, the Orthodox communions as, as much as they can. Also, the, the orchestrator, the organizer of the summer course that I'm telling you about, she's mm -hmm. Armenian. And, you know, they have a special relationship with St. Oh, Mercy's which yeah. is the Armenian school there. I know mm -hmm. they've done some Indian stuff. I don't think they've done any Ethiopian specific uh, stuff, but we had a brother, uh, Deacon Tesfai, uh, Eritrean brother just graduated from there. So like oh, right, we, have, yeah. we, have, we have certain connections there. So right. how soon into getting into theology or the study of God? And we kind of, you know, we kind of went into the weeds of it without defining it. Do you have any particular definition of theology? Do you just say study of God or how would you present it? Because I think it, it seems kind of brainy for um, people not accustomed to it, or at least when we start using the technical terms of the field, I think certain people kind of shut their brain off or get turned off. I, I, I've definitely seen that online, you know, in Facebook and right. Twitter. But how do you kind of define or pre present, you know, theology? Wow, that's a good question. I think... Um... Well, as I've studied theology, it was really like studying the uh, the heritage of the church, like the liturgy, the writings of the fathers, the Bible and things like that. So it's definitely, uh, you know, studying the tradition mm -hmm. that's been handed down to us. But I think ultimately, I think theology can't just be, you know, the study of that tradition, but it has to be uh, uh, an an active relationship with God and whatnot. And I think that's why, you know, seminaries and that, that probably show, that's probably why I define it that way because St. Vlad's was a seminary. So it's like, you didn't only study these things. Like you had to like participate in chapel and whatnot. So you had to go to, um, you know, matin services every day. You had to go to Vesper services every day. 
And uh, that was part of the formation of studying theology. Um, so I think it's definitely that it's a, a historical understanding of what the church has to offer us, but it's also um, your personal relationship with God. Um, yeah. I, that's, I that's, that's, that's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I know we've, we've had a personal context. I believe it was uh Alamayo, who first put us in touch, so you know, give a right. yeah, hat yeah. tip to him. But we yeah. also have the mutual in Dr. Richard Benton, who's a Hebrew right. Bible scholar and uh, a member of my podcasting network, the Ephesus School Network, um, where I have the Tuado Bible study. And um, so I, I know we've had those connections, but we've also had the pleasure of teaching together under UO2EY. I remember one year, I think it was for Abiz Om, the Great Fast. You had one week of the Great Fast of teachings, and then I had another week. So we got to hear each other uh, teach in these public platforms together as well. So mm -hmm. once you got back to the US, I imagine before that you hadn't been teaching. How did how did you get into um, the role of teaching? And I and I've been noticing you've been stepping it up more, at least uh, releasing public footage of it more. So I appreciate that. But oh, how, yeah. how how did you get into um, teaching in the church? Did you find a straightforward structure to doing that, or you know what was it? No, you know, uh, since I was only at St. Vlad's for a year, I never took the uh, or I was in the MA program too, so I never took the homiletics course, which is like a class on preaching. Um, so it was just um, like fathers of the church, of the specific churches, they would, they would like just ask me to teach and whatnot. So that was really, uh, that was my introduction to teaching. And um, and did you start in Amharic yeah. or Tigrinya or did you go straight to English? Like they, yeah, was, they, they knew they wanted and they knew they wanted an English servant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in English, yeah. Because I don't think... Yeah, in my I, I wouldn't be very fluent in either languages to be able to to teach. Like I don't have command of those languages like I do of English. So um and plus the it was it's a great opportunity for the youth who are mm -hmm. there to like hear something because from the time they get to church to like by the time they leave, they you know, young people are probably lost as far as like what's going on in the church and stuff. So it's, I think that, that that's a good opera. That is the reason why they would ask me to teach in English. And I think that was, that's a great opportunity for, you know, people to hear things uh, in English and whatnot. And what was the reaction of, I don't know. I mean, you must have been, were you around just a great batch of fathers where everyone was for it? Cause I don't always find that the case. Did you get any pushback yeah. about erasure of our culture and languages from any parents or older members of the laity? Or was everyone that's you know hunky dory good. about it? Yeah, that's that's actually a good uh a good question. I think um for the most part people were okay. Um I think I maybe the one time after I gave a sermon, uh one of the monks kind of asked me like, you know, what did you teach about or something like that? And he gave me the impression that like maybe someone had told him like I was off on something or something. Mm -hmm. But um yeah, as far as people kind of understand that their children, this is my assumption, people understand that their children, you know, need to learn about the faith and that they're, su they're in such maybe like a dire situation like the youth are. And so, you know, this is an opportunity for their youth to participate in the church and to like hear something that, that might be valuable for them. But as far as me directly, like someone coming up to me, I, I've never really had much pushback or anything like that. But I do have a, somewhat of a problem teaching in English. And the only reason why is because I feel like the majority of the people in the congregation either speak Amharic or Tigrinya. So like, I'm like, do they really understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm trying to like dumb down my language, but that becomes like a lot of like cognitive work to do that. You know what I mean? So that's always been like part of the challenge of speaking with English. If I'm speaking to other English speakers, then that's easy because I, I yeah. like, there's so many, I mean, it's just natural at that point. In, in isolation, right? So you're yeah. not taking them to a private room. You're preaching from Auda Mihiratu, from the circle of mercy right. or the pulpit. Right. 
and right. you're not doing it in isolation. So you have a mixed crowd. Yeah, I think exactly. I think it's us, you know, really trying to split the baby, which is why I gave a hat tip to the uh, YOTC crew. Anyone right. knows the story of Solomon knows you don't split the baby. So, um, you know, I think we kind of have to choose one or the other. And uh, I've been mm -hmm. pushing my own Bishop Abu Nabarramas of Southern California a long time. Like, man, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too, you know? Yeah. Um, it's a hard pill for people to swallow. But if we're serious about staying in North America, um, mm -hmm. look at the success of the other Orthodox uh, communities that have been here. Right. And um, if anything, you know, you know, some people say, let's have an English liturgy once a month. Uh, you know, I say, if anything, let's have a Giz liturgy once a month, you mm -hmm. know, and, and go all Giz. Why not? If you want to do that and then teach the people in Amharic or Tigrinya, whatever they want to learn in um, at separate right. times, separate from the liturgy or, you know, during the, the one gale or the, or the gospel reading. Um, right. But yeah, that's, that's interesting. So you're kind of split because you're addressing different people. So right. even let's say the English speakers amongst the Ethiopians that you're serving, mm -hmm. are they, all ages or are there different age groups no to be honest they're really like they're i, I want to say they're young the oldest they probably get is like their teens when when i look into the uh to the congregation that that is like pretty much the uh the age group that i find so you don't find yeah. ethiopian americans your age that you're serving oh no no and that's funny because i've always told people that i never find like peers like me born and raised at my age at least you know but uh yeah i you'll don't find really... some in la you'll find some in la and you'll find some yeah. in dc i'm sure they're right, in right. seattle i just don't know what they're up to they might be scattered at all the different par parishes you guys have a lot of parishes too i know right. we have 10 in, in about 10 in southern california i don't know how much you have in the seattle oh wow in area. southern california yeah. yeah i don't i don't really know in seattle maybe um no, I don't no, know. Maybe so. No, no worries. Um, but, know. but okay. So you got started teaching, and in order to teach, you have to start like feeding yourself more. So, mm -hmm. how did you begin to spiritually uh, feed yourself? And from this, I think uh, the audience could learn what resources they can go to. I get this. This is probably the number one question I get when people email me or leave me YouTube comments. Is you know, Henok, wh where can you point me to resources? And first it's a general Orthodox resources, then it's a general Oriental Orthodox. But then even more than that, people ask me specifically for Ethiopian Orthodox resources. And of course the language barrier is a thing, but there are some things in English. Where where did you kind of um, start feeding yourself spiritually? And where would you recommend people go if, if you wanted, you know, to start spreading um, more people to start teaching like you? Well, um, I guess reading like the fathers, whether they're like more like ancient fathers or uh, or early church fathers or even contemporary kind of theologians and whatnot. I think for me, like, you know, going studying theology, like I was reading, especially at Hellenic College, I, I spent a lot of time reading Florovsky because I really loved his writing and I really loved like just his... Uh, mystagogy yeah and um so i was really reading a lot of that but w over time what i started to realize was like i needed to start reading like theology written um uh, in our church and mm -hmm. whatnot so that's kind of how i took the turn so i i still was like keeping that critical still using the way of thinking that i learned from seminary and whatnot but trying to read more widely and what and stuff like that so but i think where you could start is definitely to like read the fathers um like you can find a lot of their resources online if that's too uh too heavy to read um maybe well you let's can... start there let's start there uh -huh. um the fathers is a very very broad category could i get you to do i don't know one to three or three to five fathers that you would have people start off with like i have an extremely semitic and school of antioch bias but you may have a different bias like where 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 would you point people who would you say start reading first and i think church advent is a great website that people could go to to find a lot of them for free but You're yeah right. some of them are cheap too like 
uh, I think Chris Ostom's whole works are two bucks on Kindle. Like, right, like people, right. people can spell, spend two bucks to read the fathers. But wh right. which fathers would you have people start off with? You know, I think for me, since I'm very like heady and I love like the philosophy and stuff, like reading either like Saint Basil or like Gregory of Nyssa or Gregory of Nazianzus, like reading one of those, if you're like really into like philosophy and stuff like that, because they do engage in like a lot of like Greek philosophy and stuff like that. So I think that for them, if you have that inclination, that would be great. Um, so those three fathers. Yeah, the Cappadocians. That's good. Yeah. Um, Basil, Gregory, and Gregory. Yeah. And yeah, I think another way you could kind of get into the fathers is like, what do you want to read about? Mm -hmm. um, so like commentaries can kind of be a little bit, um, it's not something I would read for like pleasure, for example, like, either St. Cyril's like commentaries or like on like the gospels or anything like that. Um, I like, I love the Psalms. So like reading like some commentary by St. John Chrysostom or like St. Cyril on the Psalms, like that would like- Cyril of Alexandria, enjoy, right? Yeah, exactly. Or of Jerusalem. No, of Alexandria. Of Alexandria, yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, or if you want to read about, I, I don't know. Like letters are kind of easy to kind of read. Mm -hmm. So like I was reading St. Cyril's letters like uh, through the Catholic University of America. They have like all these translations of the fathers. Wonderful. So yeah. So I was just reading his letters like their feast of letters. So uh, I'm guessing I don't know exactly what feast they were written for, but they're not really like, you know, as dense as maybe his commentaries would be perhaps, you know, because they're just like given for like a feast and whatnot so yeah um mm -hmm. nt wright who's this anglican scholar um mm -hmm. has kind of made this distinction even in his life right he was a bishop and he kind of gave up the bishopry in a sense to focus on theology and denser commentaries but before that was more pastoral would you say that is it fair to say these feastal letters are more pastoral and would you make a a theology versus pastoral distinction i heard another a kind of Christian podcaster recently make that distinction. I wonder if if you do as well, because you're reading them actually so that you can translate them to the people. So there's a kind mm -hmm. of pastoral element to your reading. But um, right. to your point, some people might just be reading theology for fun. Right, right. Um. So. Uh, do would I make a distinction between like theology and like say like pastoral mm -hmm. kind of stuff? Like food I guess, for the soul, I guess, versus I don't want to put it this way, but food for the mind. Like, is it just for your own personal spiritual growth up the you know divine ladder of ascent, or is it in order to share it with the local children at your parish that you're teaching? Oh, I see. Yes, more so for the the children that I'll be teaching or the English speakers that I'll be teaching. And um, yeah, cause you know, they explain things very well. I mean, you know, obviously like the fathers knew, you know, what they were talking about. So it's like, you know, when you read what they, what they wrote, it's like, you're getting a very good interpretation of like Christ, you know, his crucifixion, you know, his resurrection and things like that, especially when you're reading like those feast of letters, like uh, of St. Cyril of Alexandria. And um, so, yes, yeah, definitely for me to like understand the theology a lot more, but it will, it'll be used in a, in a pastoral way and stuff. And um, I do remember to, I, I, I audited this class on Oriental Orthodoxy Unveiled uh, at the University of Toronto. And uh, one of the, the professor was saying that uh, that theological writing or like the, yeah theological writing can be divided into three types of writing. Okay, I put myself on the spot. It was like uh, uh, okay, I can't even remember. But there's like there's three different cat there's three different uh, ways or categories of theological writing. 
and whatnot. And it's in his book, Oriental Orthodoxy Unveiled. Um, but um, yeah, to 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 your point, when you said you had heard a podcaster say there's like theological kind of writing and then there's like pastoral kind of writing. And I think, yeah, for writers, there is like a different like way that they're trying to express their theology and stuff like St. Paul's might be more for, you know, like some of his epistles are pastoral. And then you have other types of writings that are more, um, might be more dense, not necessarily pastoral in a sense, but um, yeah. Yeah, if I could use governance language, which, you know, mm -hmm. my original degrees in political science is funny. Someone was asking me the other day, you know, my degrees are in political science and dispute resolution. Here I am talking about, you know, the church and Amharic all the time, but uh, and dabbling in goods. But mm -hmm. uh, the governance language I would put to it is the theologians are writing for the few. And this is, you know, this is a generalization. So take it with a grain of salt or a kilo if you'd like. But uh, the theologians are writing for the few and the the pastors or the pastoral ministers are um, writing for the many. Mm -hmm. So, you know, are you writing for other, you know, let's be frank, other philosophical dudes like you who go through these dense texts and, uh, you know, potentially using it for debate or discussion or distinction from other mm -hmm. branches of Christendom? Or are you using it for the practical everyday the, or the day-to-day -day needs of the the people at your parish and, and we don't have to dwell too much on that point i think we can make it more specific you were saying kind of before we got on the recording uh you'd like to talk about augustine i think it'd be helpful to get your hot takes on like three different let's say people in the church to be safe right you know some some might call them fathers some might call them saints but to get away from the controversy let's just say let me just lay out their names and talk about how they kind of relate to us and then see how you would approach, you know, reading them. Because this is what happens when you engage the fathers is that um, different people consider different people fathers. And, and, and even, you know, the Catholic church uses certain terms like doctors of the right. church, which I find very fascinating. For example, St. Ephraim, um, you know, who's clearly in the Syriac tradition, even though he's pre-schism. And then you have someone clearly post-schism in Armenian, which originally would stem from the Syriac, right? Like right? um, St. Gregory of Narek, uh, calling them right, a doctor. Right, I find right. these things very fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, but let, let me throw these three names at you. Augustine, Origen, and St. Isaac the Syrian. So Augustine is in the West, and I, uh, I had a subdeacon Daniel Kakish, uh, Syriac uh, subdeacon on my program. I think he said something like the Syriac church didn't even know he existed until 800 years later, which I found very hilarious. Oh, really? Um, I, don't, I don't know when exactly we would have learned of him. Obviously, like we're in, in the 21st century and the 20th century, so we do know about him. But I wonder even when he was on our radar, but he's definitely pre-schism, but he's like in, in the Latin part of the fathers, right? right. I, I always divide the fathers linguistically. You are dividing right. them kind of thematically. I like to divide mm -hmm. them um, geographically, which which follows along with uh, linguistically, right? So he's in North yeah. Africa, but under kind of Roman territory. So the language of education was uh, Latin. Perhaps uh, nobody knows for sure. Perhaps he was, you know, speaking Berber or Amazigh from from birth. But the language of education and of the elite would have been Latin mm -hmm. in his sphere. Then you have Origen, who is writing and thinking in Greek. Uh, however, maybe some sort of uh, late Pharaonic or Coptic was his um, kind of birth language. I don't I don't know for sure. Maybe he was speaking Greek in the household, and he's kind of more in our church, but was posthumously or after death kind of uh, condemned. And I don't know all the specifics there, but I've seen people debating about that. And then you have someone like St. Isaac the Syrian, who is different than the other two in that he's very clearly in a communion in the Persian Empire, which only accepts the first two councils, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas we have three and then split with others on the fourth. And then, you know, the people in the, the, the Latin and Greek speaking world have seven councils. And yet he seems to be well respected in all the communions. And I pointed this out to people. Mm. But our whole the whole book of Mas'afa Menokosat, or the book of monks in our tradition, is all people from his his communion, which is the Assyrian right. Church of the East. Um, let's start with Augustine, but that's mm -hmm. kind of me laying the land for you. How do you approach and read Augustine? 
Yeah, that's a uh, good question. I um I haven't read much of Augustine. I think uh, if I could, I'll, I just want to talk about the reception and the problem mm -hmm. of the reception with, say, Augustine or Origen or uh, Mar Isaac uh, or St. Isaac. But um, Mar Isaac is good. That's good. Yeah, that's, the, yeah. the, that's the East Syriac word for Lord. I like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. The patriarchs are called Mormoran and Marmaran. I see. Yeah. Exiagaist. <laughs> yeah. I think for Augustine, um, I, there's just like so much confusion. Like I, for example, um, uh, Bishop Carillus, who's a bishop in the Coptic church, uh, I was listening to a video, the, a lecture that he gave on YouTube that was published on YouTube maybe like two weeks ago or something. And uh, he said that Augustine was just recently, I guess, received or canonized in the Coptic church. So I was like, okay. That's fascinating. And then I was looking at a uh, a textbook from the uh, Holy Trinity Theological College in Addis, and it I, if I'm not mistaken, it refers to Augustine as a saint in the textbook. But then you have people who like who don't really uh, who wouldn't say that he's a saint. Like for example, um, I forgot his name, but he's a very well known uh, preacher in dc but he says saint augustine is not a saint but i think maybe the issue really because he's a pre uh he's pre-chalcedon pre-council of chalcedon so it's like in that sense i don't know it could be up to like judgment you know whether he would be a saint in the sense that uh you know he doesn't come from like say a church that we're not in communion in at that point but the issue, right. I think... He's for sure a Christian. The question is, is he an authoritative father teacher? Is that what you're getting right. at? And then the canonization question is a whole other story. Yeah. I think I was trying to touch upon, like, the canon, the canonization question. Because he's, like, I don't, I don't know what year he was even canonized, like, saying the Roman Catholic Church. And when I was going to school at Hellenic College, people were saying he's not a saint. He's blessed. I guess they were trying to make that distinction. Um but um, yeah, this whole idea, because I've heard he's written ab ab about things that are not necessarily uh, acceptable. And so, yeah, I don't know, this term father, saint, blessed, I don't really know uh, kind of how to make that happen. But I, I think maybe if there's like, if he's in, someone told me he was in the Synaxarium, but I checked and he wasn't there. So, but if there is a text, like maybe Haimano Ta'abo, or like maybe some other ecclesiastical text that we use and if and if if he's in there then i think that that's a good that's our most authoritative uh claim we can make that he would be a saint you know what i mean yeah aside there's from a, people, yeah go ahead no aside from you know like the textbook at the for the patrology at the at holy trinity or like Different people, like everyone, like you said, is decentralized. There's no really like consensus about certain things. Um, so I think the most authoritative way we can make our claim is just really if he's in some ecclesiastical text, you know, like a text that the church uses and whatnot. Yeah, there is this thing that um, both Jonathan Peugeot and Richard Rowland were reminding me of our own particular tradition in the way that they had this Yamastarak limd, or this idea of China, say everything is in agreement. I, I do find uh, certain blanket statements of the fathers difficult because sometimes they disagree. Mm -hmm. You know, like people, they don't like pointing this out, but I mean, just look at St. Cyril of Alexandria, whom we've mentioned and we love as a father, but uh, there's some tension between him and St. John Chrysostom. And um, I don't like pretending that that tension didn't exist. And uh, mm -hmm. that tension wasn't just like, oh, awkward uh, to meet up at like a Orthodox meeting or something. It's like it had practical ramifications in the life of St. John Chrysostom, whose earthly life didn't you know, end in a way that we want, but you know, it's, a, it's a cross that he had to bear uh, in exile. 
and in, in earthly shame, but in what I'd say heavenly glory and persecution for Christ's sake is, you know, it's a beautiful thing. But um, I guess to bring it back to Augustine, but in the big picture way, I don't expect anyone to agree 100%. I don't know, would you slap a percentage of how much you have to agree with someone for them to be an authoritative father or even a saint? I, 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 do, I do find some of these reminiscent of at least the caricature of the medieval scholasticism of the Latin church. And I, I really do try to avoid things like that. I, I, you know, uh, people talk about Dorothy Day and potentially canonizing her in the, uh, in the Catholic church. And I think she did a lot of great things, um, but I think she had repented if I'm not mistaken, of, a, of an abortion in her life. And, you know, that's a very harrowing subject to think about and to cross. But some people would say, you know, that blemish would bar you from ever being canonized a saint. I, I don't know how you think of these matters, but, you know, how much, how much sound doctrine or what percentage sound doctrine would someone have to be, you know, a father or a saint in, in your view? Because I do think like people are going to disagree, right? Even fathers have to disagree. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I that's a a good question in in particular, or particularly because it's like, is their doctrine the reason for their saint for their sanctity or for their, you know, uh, canonization as a saint? And th that's a really good question. I would want to say that it would have to, I mean, from the way I kind of understand the fathers, the fathers were saints, but everything they did or everything they wrote was for the most part, uh, like, um, sound. Like I know St. Gregory of, I think it's Nyssa who wrote about like, uh, the forgiveness of like, I could be wrong here, but it was like even the devil or no, that everyone should be saved that like that everyone could be saved no matter like, I guess kind of their, their situation. I, I guess maybe was it St. Isaac or St. Ephraim? It might've been St. Isaac who kind of taught a similar thing. I yeah, just remember yeah, reading that. It wasn't Ephraim. It was Isaac. It was uh, Isaac. Yeah. He has a similar, a yeah. similar, um, his descriptions of hell. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, that, and, that's, and in origin yeah. posthumously, I think that's why as well. Right. Um, where the period of the church, I think, is relevant too, right? Like I would judge Isaac and Gregory harsher than I would judge Origen because Origen was so early, right? He's writing right. in the two hundreds, right. where a lot of these things, you know, how developed are they? How widespread is the sharing of information, right? And um, all that. So, um, yeah, uh, how do you, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that that all should be shaved. All I said shaved. That all should, uh, should be saved. That's a tongue twister. Um, is a plain heresy because it goes against God as judge and judgment mm -hmm. day, which is one of the Amaida Mister or one of our five pillars of mystery in the Tawahado tradition, which is that all all people at one day from the you know from the Sarota Hamanos from the prayer of faith will be raised from the dead. Right, the quick and the dead or the living and the dead will be judged by mm -hmm. God. So, um, you know, <laughs> it's basically trying to tip the scale in his judgment and saying he could only judge in another way, which I think is any of these authors just uh, kind of creating a backdoor for their own selfish uh, salvation concerns, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, so, so um, let's say Origen has this belief. Um, do you still or have you ever encountered the writings of origin or what would you would you encourage any student at your church to to pick up something that he wrote like uh, you know he's one of the first bible commentaries yeah i don't think i would uh, want to suggest that to people who don't really who haven't read theology or who don't know kind of how to judge theology uh because like his uh idea of like the soul being pre like pre-eternal or something like that like uh if you don't know theology you probably would just be consumed and believe whatever origin wrote but um yeah so i wouldn't suggest that anyone who has no the no background in theology start off with origin and to your question whether i had read any of his writing in my uh 
one of my patristic classes <coughs> with uh father john bear that was um we because he was doing a translation at the time well, now it's been published but at the father time john bear's he, an originist <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um yeah, so I read we we had to read something from uh origin from that Father John Bear translated himself. Um and yeah, but the thing and you weren't corrupted by that text? No, I wasn't. No. I mean it's I mean you can read something and just be like, oh, like I don't know, like that's that's interesting that he said that. I mean, it wasn't anything controversial in what he wrote. It's not like origin see. It's not like Origin was just like everything he wrote was heretical or something like that. But like the particular thing we were reading wasn't even like I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't really like anything that controversial or anything like in the view of Origin's like work and stuff. But the the other thing, too, that's kind of interesting is that like I don't think the Ethiopian church has like or any of the Oriental Orthodox churches. I could be wrong. Maybe the Coptic church has. But like as far as like condemning origin, like I think that's really the Eastern Orthodox Church that has only done that historically. And that I, and that was like centuries later. And so I do agree with what you were saying that like we would judge St. Gregory of Nyssa and St. Isaac more harshly than origin because origin was like, you know, do, he was one of the first people to really like on a like very big scale, like do theology and commentaries and stuff like that. So but as far as um you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm whenever I hear like uh, an Ethiopian theologian say Origin is condemned, I'm like, yeah, he he is condemned. But I think it would be maybe more appropriate for us to say like his teaching is like uh, some of his teachings are unacceptable because there is no like official, you know, statement or anything. Maybe the Coptic Church has. I'm not sure because he was an Alexandrian, but uh, I just don't know if like. You know, we're kind of, we're saying he's condemned, but that condemnation was like an Eastern Orthodox thing. You okay, know, and, I don't and know. What do you make then of someone like Marisak? You even started by calling him Marisak, which is how we say it in our tradition, which is this very respectful, honorific, which we picked up from the, the East Syriac. The West Syriac say Mor. They usually say Mor. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, this guy who's centuries after the councils that we accept, but at least, you know, his tradition as on paper um not accepted it but we've accepted kind of his writings we've recognized some of his writings i think it it has to say something about how the ethiopian church in a sense is open-minded and and looks mm -hmm. at everything that it would consider to be christendom but what, what do you make of his writings and the other writings of the church of the east that we find in our tradition well really my uh, intro to Saint Isaac the Syrian was really through his ascetical homilies, mm -hmm. but like, um, and I know his ascetical homilies are really prized. Um, I have the Mitzahafa uh, Monokosat that has um, one of the three books is uh, Mar Yisak, but I haven't read that yet. But um, I think I think what you said was right that the Ethiopian Church is much, and I think it's like thanks to kind of this decentralized way of kind of not in terms of governance but in just terms of appropriation and reception that like you know it's it's very practical in that sense um so i think yeah i guess if like saint isaac the syrians like uh writings are beneficial or helpful then we would use that and appropriate that and then you know just kind of just kind of be i don't know i would say be cautious of maybe other things that might have been controversial or contentious or anything like that but i do think that uh you're right that the yeah kind of the generous and like the generous way of like appropriating things is is something that's very like smooth and like not as controversial i feel I, this would be my guess but in the roman catholic church it would be very different like there would like have to be like m a lot of like 
it would be much more scrupulous, I think, to like determine whether some like can we accept this person or can we not accept this person and stuff like that. Whereas for us, it's much more organic. I think that's the word I was trying to use. It's much more organic yeah. in the way it receives things. So if somebody's like been print like the Psalms, for example, like we've all, like the early church always prayed the Psalms, and it was a practical like it was an organic thing that the church prayed the Psalms because like that was kind of the the form of prayer and whatnot during that time. And so even though the Psalms kind of like when you when you bring up theoretical questions like what do you mean like dash his child against a stone or like all these like you know praying for revenge and vengeance and stuff like when you get into the theoretical realm then it becomes a lot more stickier but i think like when you're just looking at um this or uh, yeah just the organic nature of reception in the orthodox church i think that's how we make sense and why we use like fathers like that but again, like the church, you know, the church has the ultimate say. And so, yeah, so those those are just my opinions, but. No, I don't yeah. know. I mean, yeah. I think of the fiat of the Pope getting Gregory of Narek, St. Gregory right. of Narek, an Armenian man, centuries wow. after schism to be a doctor, not just a saint, a doctor of the, there are many doctors. Look up all right. the doctors You're of the right. Catholic church yeah. and not that many of them. And now yeah. they got an Armenian in there. So to your point, it was like, you know, I don't know how scrupulous it was, but mm, <laughs> it came yeah. from the top. It came You're from right. the top. Whereas, I don't know, maybe some Deptarasvek in the Isaac and then some other monks liked it and then it just stayed. You know, that's where the organic like community element of it that you're talking about is. Um, mm. I, I know I've had several monks when I've asked them about Masaf Amenokosat with the book of the monks. They're like, uh, yeah, don't read it. <laughs> I'm like, what? Oh, really? Or they'll be like, read it later in your life or read it but don't share it with people like they, they're always strange comments they make about it but were there mm. any practical pieces of life advice any gems that you recall from the ascetical homilies no it's 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 been um it's been a while you know they were very you know they're titled the ascetical homilies so i think part of the reason why i kind of put them down was because they're really designed for monks and so like for example he he would speak a lot about not leaving your cell mm -hmm. and stuff um and so these Say different a little bit of about that because i used that phrase when mahoy Maryam passed away uh -huh. and i remember my own sister was startled and she's like why did you say cell like people not in the context don't understand so can you speak a little right. bit about a monastic cell yeah i think uh i think a monastic cell is just really the um the room that a monk inhabits and that our monk or a nun inhabits. And um, yeah, that's where there's, they spend most of their time because monks aren't really uh, allowed to be wandering or to be doing any other thing because they've renounced the world. And so they live in these monastic communities if they're not hermits. So being in that cell, which is basically their room where, um, yeah, and so being in that cell, that's probably where a lot of ascetical kind of things like the the writings of the Desert Fathers or, you know, things of that nature talk about how you have to keep yourself busy or how you have to basically how you win the fight that you have with your thoughts and your flesh and stuff like that as a monastic. So all those kind of take place kind of within the cell and stuff like that especially because i think the thing the key thing to remember is that a monk is someone who does not live you know geographically kind of in the world but like in a monastery so when they're in that monastery that room that they inhabit is their cell so i, I think that was just kind of how i would like no that's good um you make this distinction between not just clergy and laity but monastics and everyone else and there's this thing that i don't like as much but you know it's part of the tradition where i don't know if you've been around it but i've heard a lot of ethiopians you know they'll refer to for example soma Hawara, the fast of the apostles as yesene som or june fast or even worse yek som or that's a fast just for priests and i hear right. the same thing about the one um 
our, our version of Advent, right? So the, the fast of the prophets, they'll say, oh, so you, is so no. mm-hmm. that's, a, that's only for the priests. It's not for the laity. Right. Whereas the church, you know, kind of uh, proclaims seven mandatory fasts throughout the year. Um, what, what do you think then of this delineation? You, you think this is a delineation to have? Like some, certain things are just for monastics, certain things are just for clergy, certain things are for laity. I know there's a, a clergy laity distinction in the liturgy in terms of the people's parts, but mm. is that you're saying that's the case with literature as well? Yeah, like there's I've, no fruit, there's no point to people reading it if they're in the laity. Mm. That's I think that's a good question. I think for me, it, it's just not like written, I guess, for lay people. So at least the ascetical homilies from the homilies that I did read, I didn't read like you know all his homilies, but even reading like some of the writings of the uh, the Desert Fathers. Um, which is not a book that the Ethiopian church like uh, is not part of like our tradition, but in, I'm not exactly sure where those texts were found, but I, but I think um, it has to be Egypt, but I wonder, yeah. you know, the Egypt's kind of a weird place because they had Greek. So the, right. the written language is Greek. So I think the, the Eastern Orthodox could appropriate it. And of course they have, you know, their mm-hmm. anti-Pope in Alexandria who claims to be the metropolitan right. of all africa right right uh you know someone was having a facebook discussion the other day they were alarmed because they saw a white bishop who claimed to be the bishop of Oxum, and they're like what's going on they didn't know what was going oh, on yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was cracking up about that you know i didn't right. i just didn't comment because i thought it was hilarious you know it was, right. i know what's going on i don't even think they have a greek parish in Oxum. i don't know you might know better than me no i i you're right i don't think they do i remember a professor of mine was saying he got ordained in Aksum. This was back when I was at Hellenic College. And he was like, he wasn't my professor actually, but he was the professor for patristics. And in my mind, I was like, what bishop would have ordained him in Aksum? Like what church? And, yeah. the, but you're right. Like there is a bishop, I guess, who oversees that area, I guess. The bishop, he would be a Greek speaking bishop in Alexandria, Egypt, that would then, you Oh, because he oversees all of Africa. Yes. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's a great Haggadah Sipkat to have. That's a great diocese. <laughs> you're right. You're <laughs> all right. of Africa. Oh. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but yeah, I think what you were saying about like, is like ascetical literature even beneficial for lay yes. people? Like, uh, like I think of the Canaanite woman who's seeking mm-hmm. just the crumbs of the table. Are there crumbs from the table of ascetic literature? Or is there just no value at all for the laity? No, there is. There, there, there would be value. Uh, and I think here I would want to make a distinction between the types of ascetical literature. So the ascetical homilies, it might be a little bit more difficult to extract a lot more gems. But I think from like the writings of the Desert Fathers, especially the writings that have, they're, they're much more applicable to our lives. Um, like telling you that like, you know, if you're, when you, like St. Anthony was thinking about all the crazy things happening in the world and uh, an angel of the Lord tells him, you know, just think of just like kind of worry about yourself. I think it was kind of like the gist, like, don't worry about these things. That's like, that's for God and his wisdom or something like that. And so like from that, from a saying like that, we can kind of like understand like, okay, maybe the types of questions we ask, you know, really matter, you know? So like, instead of wondering, like, you know, why is everything I see, like chaos or why is there evil in the world and stuff like that maybe i should not think like that and instead maybe focus on myself or focus on some other question you know what i mean um so i think in the writings of the desert fathers there's a lot of things that they can take but i think saint uh isaac the syrian was very kind of like ascetical i guess i don't know that's probably not the best way to differentiate those two books but um yeah yeah you know there's the the great american uh philosopher fba background gucci main who said that you need to have sauce to become the boss but sometimes you can get lost within the sauce and so i think that's a great call to moderation perhaps 
and maybe he goes too much into the depths, right? They're both assets, right? They're talking about, mm. but maybe you're saying there's something more approachable about the the desert fathers, right. which, which are we're talking about the Egyptian desert, here, right? If right, I'm not mistaken. Right. So, yeah. you know, I think um, I think we could consider that within <laughs> our tradition as well. Even yeah. you know, the like I said, both the Egyptians and the Greeks were writing in Greek during that period. It wasn't until later the Copts started writing in Coptic and then in Arabic. Um, right. and, 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 and there are some claims, of course, that the Arabic shifted some of their thought in a more Semitic way. Some people say influence to Islam, but I think the language itself lends itself to different ways of thinking and doing that are more grounded in, in reality than the Indo-European languages. Now, that's, again, my Semitic bias. Right. But, um, I did, I did want to say one thing. Uh, was that asceticism, regardless whether you're a monastic or a lay person or a priest, like asceticism is something that's required of us. So praying, mm -hmm. fasting and all these things. But I think the reason why some ascetical literature that's written by monastics might be challenging is because they're writing um, for monks. So talking about your cell or talking about that you have to work and pray and like, you know, all these various types of things, they're very like, it's really designed for the lifestyle of a monk, but that's not to be confused that lay people are also not supposed to be, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, ascetical in nature too. Um, and uh, there was um, a professor at Fordham, uh, Aristotle Papa Nicolau, and I was listening to one of his lectures and he made a really good point about the church and asceticism. And one thing he said was like, you know, like if you go to like a dance school, no matter how like say uh, how bad of a character your dance instructor might have or how, you know, lack of prestige the dance school might have. Like if you listen to like what you're being told, you will eventually learn how to dance. And what he was trying to talk about was like how, you know, in the church there might be politics or there might be you know, people who might be bad individuals, but that your your growth or your spiritual maturity is kind of independent of them. Just like how in dancing, you know, it's independent of like what other person's opinions might be or what other person's, you know, uh, politics or what other person's view on the world might be, you know? And I think that was a really insightful way of understanding the church uh, because, yeah, no matter, and I think even in the canons, it says something like, even if like a priest may kind of be living in sin or something, you can still receive the Eucharist from from him because, because it's like the priesthood is not like sort of affected by the priest's sin and stuff. And so, yeah, I think that was just a really interesting way to view asceticism. Like, you know, my asceticism, as much as we want to like, you know, distance ourselves from the church sometimes, I think it's like very important that we realize that, you know, we can still grow no matter if the church doesn't appear to be at its best sometimes, or if it's difficult for us to really participate in the church. But the ascetical life is like kind of independent and our growth as Christians is like independent from, you know, whatever challenges might be in the church and stuff. So. Absolutely. And it's the grace of God that works through the sacraments or through the mysteries of the For church. Sure. And so, yeah, the, the fallible or sinful human being does not corrupt the incorruptible right. mysteries exactly. of, of God. So I 100% agree with you there. Going back briefly to St. Isaac, I guess I think I could say the job of the uh, charismatist or the, the preacher or the herald like you and I would be to try to see how we can extrapolate from the the depths of the asceticism to see if we can find any anything even a gursha worth of practical contextual advice to the north americans that we're dealing with um or as father paul nadim tarazi likes to say the 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 nato people, <laughs> the NATO people. Uh, he calls them nato people now in his podcast and it cracks me up every time um but you know, one one thing that stuck with me from Metropolitan Hilarion al Fayyab's book or his study of St. Isaac the Syrian, he actually has two studies. The second was kind of a, a printing of the transcripts of a conference. But the first one was his own study under 
uh, Dr. Sebastian Brock, who received the title Malfono from the Syriac Church, which is in communion with us. And Malfono is like a title of teacher. Oh, and wow. um, yeah, very high, even though he's in the Anglican Church. Right, he received right. this title from, from our you know sister church. I should say the same branch in a different place of our one church. And mm -hmm. um, the one chunk that I just, just kind of, I would say almost haunted me and that, that I've shared with others before is um, you mentioned the Psalms earlier, and I think the Psalms are great. This is full container of the range of human emotions that crescendos towards the end in all praise when it begins with complaints or grievances and uh, praise. And mm -hmm. he's like, okay, how do you read it? You know, um, there's this great Abba in LA, Abak al -Murk. I haven't seen him in, uh, in quite a while, but he's uh, one of the monks at Selassie in LA. A holy trinity and uh i remember he would say at minimum a nigus a day and what he calls a nigus or a king is 10 chapters of the psalms and i'm like man that's a lot he's like that's nothing i would read uh, the whole psalms every day and he's like on good friday or sikhlet i would read it the whole psalms four times in a row and i'm like man that's like that's like a saint isaac level of asceticism that i'm like man i think i'm i think i'm good and i think i'm a good christian and then I, you meet a monk like that that makes you feel lazy but right. St. Isaac says, read until you get tired. Stand up, face the east, make the sign of the cross. Just begin reading the Psalms. Wherever you are, read the Psalms. If you can get to a chapter or more, good. If um, you feel like you're going to collapse after a paragraph, fine. If you can say a sentence, that's fine. If all you can mutter is one word of the Psalms, and probably you could do more than that, but if that's all you can do, do that and put it down and don't feel guilty. But his big thing is consistency. Every night before you go to bed, just pick it up and read till you're tired and then stop. Wow. So mm -hmm. there's no timer, there's no alarm clock, there's no nothing. And to me, it's an ascetic practice, but it's so practical. I think anyone can apply that because the, the kind of degree or how long it's gonna take before you get tired, you know, who knows, you might go through 20 before you're tired, 20 chapters. Right. Right. Who knows? You maybe maybe you spend all night reading the entire book of Psalms and you didn't sleep at all. Um, right. But you're kind of leaving it up to you and to the spirit in um, in that regard. So you know there are different ways and approaches you can do it. I think right. another aspect of what we could call asceticism, right? We have scripture, we have the patristics, but you mentioned this earlier when you're talking about the like what is theology is the liturgy. I know uh, you and I have had fun with this and you've given me some very encouraging words because, you know, I have my uh, my DNA test coming back and matching what everyone's been telling me is I can't match a musical uh, pitch. So I may be doomed in, in the singing of the liturgy in our, tr our tradition where singing is so important. But um, I think the study of Dase or of the Eucharistic liturgy is uh, an ascetic practice in and of itself. It gets dangerous if you only know the, the zema or the melody and you don't know the meaning. So I'd encourage anyone who does that to also, uh, you know, put some time into learn giz because that's what the words are. Right. But um, could you tell us about your experience in learning the Kandasi? Because at least in my opinion, you can be modest about it. I think you sing it well. Yeah, well, um, so the, I started studying Kandasi with my Mamher uh, Abawal the Samait. And I was studying with him from... I guess when I came back from Ethiopia, so 2007 to probably about the time I got ordained in 2008. So for maybe a year and a half or so. And so at the time we were just like, I would record him and then I would study and then I would come back to him uh, and then I would like recite what I had studied and then we would like continue on. And, um, yeah, but I, I definitely agree with what you're saying. Like, it's, it can be, it won't be as fruitful if you don't know what you're saying. And um, and I don't know if this is how people study Kadase like, in um, back home. But I'm sure people really have a, they probably have a good understanding of good is before the, before the time they started studying Kadase. But um yeah, for me, I had that was something I had to do after the fact. So I studied Gadase, but then my learning of it um, came from like practically like learning goods and stuff like that. So I definitely agree with what you're saying um, about that. 
but that that was pretty much my uh study with Gadasi and stuff. So yeah. if we can uh get that to the, and put you on the spot a little bit, do you have any misbak up your sleeve that would allow us to mix scripture with Gadasi? Or is there any um part of the Gadasi that uh touches you? I could prompt you more if you'd like, but is there any part of the Gadasi that we can encourage you to sing for our audience so they get a taste of beauty? I do take this um I think it was Solzhenitsyn statement. It could have been Dostoevsky. So forgive me if it's, it might be Dostoevsky quoted by Solzhenitsyn, but this idea that beauty will save the world is something right. that I latch on to. I, I add humor to beauty as well. But in this case, for me, beauty is the, yeah. is the Kadase. So do you have any um, common misbox that you could share with us or any part of the Kadase that particularly touches you that you could recite for us? Um, I don't know. I guess um, the Taliu bin Tasalama Beta Christian. I don't know. I was just thinking. I about, like that. Yeah. Um, Taliu bin Tasalama Beta Christian. Ahati kadist gubai inta hawar yatir tit bahav exiav hir. So yeah. Kadasi malaik tia samalin. That was great, and it's very timely for people who know the church. Pray for the peace of the orthodox church right right um yeah. as you were saluting it as well and greeting it um mm. we've you've given people advice about how to approach patristics as we begin to close out could you give the audience advice about how the laity i think deacons often can figure it out themselves but how how do you advise the laity to get familiar with the Qaddasi or the liturgy, especially the Tasato, which I think all of them should know. And um, right. also, how would how would you advise them to get familiar with scripture? I think with scripture, the, uh, the best thing to do would probably be to, I guess, to just read it. Um, you know, even for people who study theology, there's no real, like, formal kind of introduction to the Bible. I mean, there isn't like Old Testament and New Testament classes, but it's from such like, uh, you're learning so much of the history and everything like that. But I think trying to read the Bible and trying to, uh, I guess the question they should have in mind is how, like, why is this, you know, important for me to know now? Like in what ways can I apply what I'm reading into my life today? Um, and, but if you do have the opportunity, try to see if you can read with a priest or even like you're doing, like studying the old Testament, uh, with this class at St. Vlad's, like, you know, tr maybe try to take a class or two, um, like you can audit courses at the university of Toronto. They have an, or or an Orthodox kind of program there auditing is only like 250 dollars per class so you know or like this opportunity at St. Vlad's you know try to learn kind of how to study the bible and how to read the bible and if you can't just talk to a priest about how they can uh, benefit from the bible and how to read the bible and whatnot and maybe trying to like start a uh, a bible study at your at your parish and whatnot and as far as the uh, Tasato or the um, like the congregation's responses during the liturgy, I think definitely attending liturgy uh, is important. And I think that um, also maybe trying to learn them uh, ahead of time, uh, you know, if you can. I mean, what I mean is like dedicating time to studying the actual Tasato and stuff like that, the responses. And um, yeah, and over time, it'll just become natural. 
because the liturgy is the same every sun every day or every sunday so you know you'll be able to build on what you know over time so at my longtime parish of uh, Virgin Mary's, they used to have it at 7 a.m. Now they've brought it to 6.30 a.m. Most parishes I know begin at 6 a.m. Of course, there are prayers before that as well. My new parish in the Inland Empire now starts at 5.30 a.m. But you can show it. It's so early in the morning. How could I show up to Kadasi on time? What motivates you to show up on time? Oh, I think to really uh, to worship God um i think really understanding the importance of what christ has done for us and what we are called to do as the church is to ultimately celebrate the eucharist and i think just understanding the gravity or the importance of the liturgy and of worshiping god when you when you don't take it as something that's trivial but you really understand that like you know, this is a communal thing that, you know, Christ has done for all of us in the church and that we can come and sing praises and thank God for everything he's done in the church, uh, for the church. I think, you know, we really, it becomes that much more interesting to come to church. But if it's just like, you know, I get it. If it, you don't know what they're saying, you don't know, you know, it's early and all these types of things. If that's the only way you look at it, of course, it's going to be something that that might not be motivating. But I think really understanding just how precious that time is, and the you know what a you know what a blessing, and for our salvation ultimately, you know, to receive the sacraments of the church. So, and I, I think this is why you know studying theology or anything like that is important because you really do get to understand that it's like, it's not a simple thing, you know, going to church and whatnot. Well said, beautifully said. And do you have anything that you'd like to plug for the people or any, any last parting thoughts before we go? Um, yeah, I think just uh, that we should all be praying. And I think for those of us who are, you know, Ethiopian American or who might be in the church and we don't really, it can be challenging. I'll just say, you know, just take the time to like learn, uh, learn some of these things in the church, like whatever it is, that's like a challenge, whether it's the language barrier or the culture bar cultural barrier or whatever, the, whatever the case may be to like spend time to actually learn these things and learn how to overcome them. Because, you know, if, if Christ really died and left us this church where we can find salvation here on earth, then I think it's worth, you know, whatever we have to learn to find our salvation. So that those that'd be my parting words. Amen. Thank you so much for joining the program. Thank you, Deacon Hannah, for having me.